in truth and turn to 102 in our city, the Wonders Cross. <laughs>
to 333, it pays to serve Jesus. This is one of the new songs that we did before, but, but we are reviewing. So, 333, it pays to serve Jesus. Judgment bar, I stand 
before my king, and he the book will open. He cannot find a thing that will my heart be glad. All tears of joy shall flow because I had it settled and settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. Oh, sinner, seek the Lord. Repent of all your sin, for thus he has commanded, if you would enter in, and then if you should live a hundred years below, then here you'll not regret it. You settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. sins away when the old account was settled long ago. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I got that settled. Thank you. Today. Amen. Now, one thing about the pulpit being shorter, I can't see the words of the song, so it's a good thing. <laughs> I remember most of them. All right. There was a couple of them that uh, I didn't remember exactly the same way time you remembered them, but hopefully they weren't noticeable enough to catch them. But anyway, take your Bibles to see if this is even full. I tell you what, it's going to be a long day, or a short day, I guess. If I'm already in the evening, it's going to be a short day. <laughs> but anyway, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20. Now, um, for tonight, I'm going to try to, to get on with the pro prophets. Uh, you say, preacher, you're going to watch the videos tonight? I'm not, I think I'm going to suspend watching the videos. I'm trying to get through. I got, I got another thing I, got, I finally got together. I got, I'm going to try to get started on. And I'm going to try to get started on the church uh, here shortly. Uh, we're going to talk about the church. What is the church? Where did it begin? All those kind of things. And uh, we're going to talk about those things. Uh, uh, so, but i got to get through with the prophets. And, uh, so I'm... I need to get into that subject. I got got some folks that are looking at joining, and I want to make sure we get all those kind of things covered. And uh, so I think that'd be a, be a good time to do it. So anyway, so I'm going to just try to get through the the rest of the minor prophets. I probably won't finish them all tonight, but hopefully I can get pretty close. But anyhow, so Exodus Exodus chapter number twenty and verse number four down to verse number six. Now we've covered the first commandment, uh, the first commandment. Uh, Again, well, let me just read, again read in verse number one, and I'll read down to verse number six. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And so we're going to look at this second commandment uh, here this morning. And the first commandment, of course, we looked at has to deal with the heart, has to deal with our affections. And uh, we're to love the Lord the, our God with all our heart. And, and uh, how, did that, how did that look in practicality? That's what we want to start looking at now. How, how, did that, how did that lived out? And you say, well, preacher, we're not under, under the law. No, we're not uh, under the law as far as salvation is concerned. But how are you and I going to know if we're walking like Jesus? And uh, well, you, you know, if, he, if he was a man made under the law and he did not break the law, then uh, it stands to reason that you and I, who walk like him, won't break it either. But in order not to break it, we need to understand what's it, what, what's it, what's he looking at. And uh, so we're going to look at like look at that this morning. And so we're going to look at the second commandment again in verse number four: Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is earth beneath, or that is under the water, uh, or in the water under the earth. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and of showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And so here we have the commandment uh, not to make any graven image. And uh, you say, well, preacher, why in the world would God give such a what give such a commandment? Why? Well, let's look in Isaiah chapter number 40, if you will. Isaiah chapter number 40. And I'll give you some things to consider this morning. Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse number 25. Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse number 25 says, To whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal? saith the Holy One. And so God asked the question, what are you going to liken me to? Now look at it, if you will, over in chapter number 46 and verse number 5. Chapter number 46, Isaiah 46 and verse number 5. Again, he asked the same question, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? And so there's a good question for you and I. If we're to make an image, uh, you know, anything that we make, uh, is, is doesn't matter how grand it is, it doesn't matter how magnificent it may be, but anything that we make is going to have to bring God down to our level, of our level of understanding. Uh, you know, if you can, if you make a, like the, the, the children of Israel made the two, two, the two calves, you know, what are you trying to say, that God is like a cow? You know, he eats grass, and you know, but that's what basically what you're bringing him down to your to our level. And so God says, you're not to making him because there's nothing that you and I can compare God to. Do you realize this morning that God is different than you and I? Do you realize this morning that the reason that God gave you a Bible is because God is so great that you and I could never understand. We're never, we're never going to understand God anyway. God says, as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. And uh, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You, we and I don't think alike because we're not God. God transcends all that you and I can think. You say, well, what's that word mean? That means to go over. You ever took a transcontinental flight? When you take a transcontinental flight, you fly over to God. God goes beyond anything that you and I can imagine. And so there's, no, there's nothing that you and I can come up with that can adequately and rightfully represent God. God is not a superman, by the way. God is not man at all. God is different than man. God is holy. God is God is unfathomable. He's uh, you know you look at you look at the heavens declare the glory of God. You look out at the heavens and, and you see all the greatness of what God is, but you still don't understand God. You look at all the wisdom that keeps all these things going. You know and uh, how in the world is the how, how in the world as long as the world's been going and been spinning around in circles, traveling through space, did not run any, anything else. How is it that the, uh, that the four seasons, you still got four seasons. You always have. And the Bible said, and Jesus said, until, until uh, the, the world ends, the seed time and harvest will always be. You know, my grandmother used to tell me, boy, when the, at the end of times, you won't be able to tell one season from another. The only problem is the Bible doesn't say that. There's a lot of things about that people say are in the Bible that's not in the Bible. But the fact is, God is beyond our understanding. If it were not for this Bible, you and I would not, would not know who God is and be able to understand Him. That's why we have to have a Bible. That's one of the reasons I believe in, in, in inspiration. But the other reason, and I believe in preservation. God, listen, God, if, if this word would ever have gotten lost, man by his wisdom could have never brought it back out. Man, by his wisdom, could have never figured out what the true sense of, said, true sense of the words were. God had to, had to preserve those words so that you and I would always have them. Man, man, it's just corrupt. And then, by the way, you've got, a, you've got a Bible and you find out man can corrupt that. They'll, they'll say it says all kinds of things that it don't say. But I believe that God gave us a Bible so that you and I would know who he is. As a matter of fact, Jesus, Jesus came to declare, remember he said, said uh, that, that uh, no man should send him into heaven, but the Son of Man, he's, he's come from heaven. He's come to declare God. You can't, God never, in, never tried to explain who he is. 
And in Genesis chapter number one, when God said in the beginning that God created the heavens and earth, you notice that God never tried to explain where he came from. He just declared that he was and declared that this is what he did. And over and over again, he declares what he's like. He never tries to explain himself and who he is. You and I can't, 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 I can't comprehend that anyway. I can't come and comprehend an eternal being. You say, well, why do you believe in the God if you can't, if you can't comprehend him? I believe it because he, he told me that's what he was. And boy, when you stop and look at you look at creation, you know that somebody, somebody with some smarts had to put that thing up to you. There's no way it created itself. And so you say, well, it takes a lot of faith to believe in God. It takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution. It takes a lot more faith to believe that something, that nothing somehow swirled around nothing and became something and then exploded and became all that we see. And I, I read, read uh, not too long ago uh, where, where one scientist said for it, for it to get enough energy to produce uh, what we see today, then, they all, then all the matter of the universe had to be compressed down to the size of a pinhead. Well, the problem is where did the matter come from? You're going to believe in something eternal regardless. You're going to read, believe in the eternity of matter, or you're going to believe in the eternity of God. One or the other has to be true. And I can't see a bunch of uh, uh, eternal matter just somehow uh, swirling and compacting and all this. Well, where did, where did the gravity that caused it to swirl come from anyhow? And I remember, I, I, think, I know I told you the story, but I was talking to him to a fellow, he, he, said, he said he was an atheist. And he said, yeah, and I got, I said, he said, I got all the answers. He said, I know where life came from. He said, life came from an amoeba uh, on, on an asteroid coming to, coming to the, crashing into the earth. I said, you do know what an asteroid is, don't you? I said, you do know what happens to an asteroid when it comes to the earth's atmosphere, don't you? I said, are you trying to tell me that somewhere out, 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 in, the, out in space, sometime nobody who knows how, who, what, where, when, some, something, some little, some little creature became something and uh, rode on an asteroid through the coldest vacuum of space, managed to get through that, man, then managed to get through the, through the fiery atmosphere there, crashed in, in, and survived the crash, and uh, all of a sudden now began to multiply? Takes a lot of faith to believe that. I'd rather believe that I, I find it a lot easier to believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So what are we going to compare God to? No graven images because anything that you and I make to represent God automatically has to bring him down to our level. Psalm 86 and uh, let me find Psalm 86 in verse number 8. Psalm 86 and verse number 8. Psalm 86 verse eight, number 8 says, Among the gods there is none like unto me. O, o Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. You know what the gods are, the gods he's referring to? You know that's gods with little g. That's those, those images that, God, that men have come up with. You know, you think about the gods of the Romans and the, and the Greeks. They were some pretty fickle characters. Among all those that men have come up with, all these idols that men have worshipped down through the years, well, who are they compared to God? And what are their works compared to His work? Jeremiah chapter number 10. Jeremiah chapter number 10 and verse number 6. Let's see if we can find Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse number 6 and verse number 7. Jeremiah 10, 6 says, For as much as there is none like unto thee, or none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is, and, uh, thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to, for to thee doth it appertain. For as much as uh, among all the wise men of the nations, in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. There is none like unto God. And so, what are we going to compare him to? Why would we make an image to represent him? When any image that you and I make to represent him, 
would have to bring him down again to our level of understanding. So, we're not to make any images because God is transcendent. But we're not to make any image because of a man's sinful heart, wicked heart. Jeremiah chapter number 17 and again in verse number 9 says that the heart of man is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? You realize this morning that you and I really don't understand the depths of our own heart, the depths of the wickedness of our own heart. Have you ever wondered why after you got saved, you find out that, boy, you thought I was bad. I thought I was bad before I got saved, but after I've been saved, the longer I get saved, the worse I find out that I am. Why is it? Because our heart is deceitful and we're blinded by Satan and we're blinded by our own pride and we're blinded by our own limited knowledge to understand. And the more God reveals to us, the worse we find out that we are. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. Turn with me again now to Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy chapter number 4 and verse number 14. Deuteronomy chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 14, it says, And the Lord uh, commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore a good heed to unto yourselves. For you saw no manner of similitude in the day that the Lord spake unto you in horror by, out of the midst of the fire. Lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is in, on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that, that flieth in the air, the likeness of any uh, thing that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Lest, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and see thou, and when thou seest the uh, sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and to serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But you notice he said, don't make you any kind of images, lest you be driven to worship them. You ever noticed how much man is driven to worship something? You know, how many, it's a few years now, well, a bit more than a few years back, that, that shroud or turn or whatever they found, you know. Boy, now, what, everybody wants it. Why do everybody want it? But they want to worship it. Boy, some, somehow if you see it, somehow if you touch it, somehow if you're around it, boy, it's, 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 it's somehow going to do some kind of miracle for you. Why is that? It? It's because man's heart is deceitful and is desperately wicked. And he's just... He's just bent toward that. He's bent toward things that he can see. Man is so determined uh, and so bent toward uh, walking by sight that he wants something that he can grasp hold of and see. Second Kings chapter number 18 and verse number 4. You remember now uh, Hezekiah trying to, trying to get Israel to do right. Bringing revival through the land, he's destroying all the all the all the images of all the false gods. And in his in his in his quest to do that, he finds the brazen serpent that serpent that Moses had made in the wilderness, and he destroys that brazen serpent. You know why he did it? Because Israel had begun to worship that serpent. Now let me ask you something: that serpent was a symbol of their rebellion. That serpent was a symbol of their sin. That was, serpent was a symbol of the judgment that God passed upon them and all that they suffered. Why in the world would you worship that thing? How in the world does that, 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 that serpent represent God? But yet man, in the wickedness of his heart, will worship the very thing that's an image of their shame and faith. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deuteronomy 4, wherever there, verse number 25. Deuteronomy 4, verse number 25 says, When you, thou shalt beget children, and children's children, you shall, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and ye shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image of, or the likeness of anything, 
and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. <coughs> our tendency to worship and our worship of other things that bring God down to our level that uh, really make a mockery of the name of God and who he is. They drive, bring God to anger, drive God to anger, provoke God to anger. Man has that tendency to go down. Turn with me to Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. <coughs> Romans chapter number one. And verse number, verse number 19 of Romans chapter number one says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood uh, by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You remember Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the earth shows its hand. And so man can look up into the heavens and know that there is a God. So God says they're without excuse. Verse number 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. They knew God in the creation at the beginning, every man knew God. Israel knew God. But they did not glorify him as God. What did they want to do? They wanted to bring him down to their understanding, to their love. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You see, when man began to worship idols, it's because he's corrupted himself and corrupted the God that, that, that created him and brought him down and brought themselves down. You can't make an idol without corrupting God. Now, you can't reach up to heaven and corrupt God, but in your view, in, 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 a, in a view of men, you can't corrupt God. You and I are to hold God to a high level. Boy, when we get into the next commandment, you're going to see that. But God is very protective of his character, and he says, you're not to make any kind of image. But there's some, some folks that need to learn that. You know, you don't you don't bow down to a statue. You don't bow down to a candle as representing God. You don't bow down to, to anything. God is is greater than all those things. And we're to hold him up in that high and exalted position. So we're not to we're not to, to make images because God is transcendent. We're not to make Im images because God uh because of the wickedness of our heart, but we're not to make images because of the practices associated with it. Exodus chapter number 32 and verse number 6. Exodus chapter 32 and verse number 6. Let me see if I set it in the foot. Oh, that's because I'm still in Isaiah. Boy, oh, long way off. Exodus chapter number 32. Is that what I said? 32, yeah. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 6. That's probably read better there. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 6. Now Moses has come down to the mountain. Aaron's made the two golden, the made the golden calves, and, and the children of Israel are worshiped in those golden, golden calves. In verse number 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You say, well, what does that rose up to play have the idea? Do? If you look in Genesis chapter number 26 and verse number 8, you'll find out that same word is used in uh, of uh, Isaac and Rebekah, where the Bible says that, that the king of, of, of the land there looked out and he saw Isaac sporting with Rebekah. 
And they wouldn't play football either. You get the idea this morning. You say that, that has to do with, with uh, sexual connotations. When they rose up to play, they weren't, again, they weren't playing football and volleyball. They were involved in all kinds of uh, filthy things that, that ought not to be done. Leviticus chapter number 18 and verse number 21. Leviticus chapter number 18 and verse number 21. Leviticus 18 verse number 21 says, uh, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to mow it, neither shalt thou profane, uh, profane the name of the Lord thy God, or the, the name of thy God, for I am the Lord. And so you notice he said, he talks about passing, the children passing through the fire. We're not we're to be careful about the, 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 uh, the worship of, of idols. Has, has always has had kind of uh, sexual problems, and it's always had a, a, a lack of understanding or a lack of appreciation for human life. Why would you make your child pass through the fire? Why would you so sacrifice your child to an idol of God? You see, when you bring God down to a different level, to a lower level, you automatically bring man who's created in the image of God down to a lower level. That's why you have abortion today. America is on its downward path. We're on a downward path. And if you go back to Romans chapter number one, you'll find out that, that when, they, they, when, they, when they began to worship God, they, began, they corrupted, the, they corrupted their, their view of God and they corrupted themselves in the process. You go on down and you find out that you, he started mentioning that for that reason God gave them up and gave them over to homosexuality and all those things. You see, what you see in America between abortion and homosexuality is telling you that we've lost who, our respect for who God is. And as a result, we've lost our respect for who man is or what man is who's created in the image of God. But we're not only to do that because of not to uh, uh, make images because of the practices associated with it, but we're not to make images because of the foolishness of it. Turn with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 5 and verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter number 5 and verse number 1. And I'm cutting out some of these verses for, for sake of time. I'm running out of time here. Jeremiah 5 21 says, uh, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes to see and see not, which have ears to hear and hear not. Think about that. Now God's talking about a people that's foolish. Back over in Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 19. Isaiah 40, 19 says, The workman melted a graven image, and the goldsmith spread it uh, over it over with chains and cast the silver chains. He that is so impartial that he hath no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot, and seeketh unto a man of uh, in a man seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. You stop and think about it. Here's a man who's so impartial. He doesn't even have an offering, but he'll he'll pay a pay a workman to build an idol that can't move, that can't talk, that has to be carried from place to place. And says to that, says to that idol, you're my God, you're my hope, you're my help. Isn't that kind of foolish? But that shows the desperate wickedness of the heart of man. When man begins to lose sight of who God truly is, He'll corrupt himself and go downward to do some of the most foolish things that you can ever imagine. But now God says you're not to do these things. He said, for lie the Lord thy God, I'm a jealous God. A jealous God. Anybody who's been married or had a boyfriend or girlfriend, they know what jealousy is. Listen, I, I don't mind you talking to my wife, fellas, as long as you keep your distance. Okay? 
You can talk to her as long as you keep your distance. And I'm there to see it. But don't think you're going to get her back here in some back room and talk to her privately. You've got another thing coming. That's not going to happen. You say, why? Because I'm a jealous husband. That's my life. And I'm not going to share it with nobody. Okay? Got, to, got that settled, right? Anyway, so you know the biggest way to get in trouble is to try something like that. We'll get, you know, you say, well, preacher, you are easy to get along with. Most of the time I am, but there's some things that was <laughs> just rub you wrong way. God said, I'm a jealous God. You say, is that good? That's good. You know why? Because that great jealous God is jealous of those who are created in his image. And he's not willing that any should perish. You know, it's the jealousy of God for his love for, for, for people that it causes it, that it brings us to salvation. But in the negative aspect, it also means he won't share his love with anybody else. You start to share, trying to share your love for God with somebody else, and God will say, hey, listen, time out. We're going to get this straight right here now. If I have to put you in a corner, I'll put you in a corner. But we're not going to do this. So he's a jealous God. But now, like I say, I'm in a hurry. I'm going to talk to you about the, the workings of a jealous God. Notice he says visiting. Visiting the iniquity. In verse number uh, five says, Thou shalt not bow thyself down to the, unto them, or to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Evidently, God associates idol worship with the hatred of God. And he says to those who will do such a thing, I will visit my wrath upon you, your children, unto the third and fourth generation. Man needs to learn that man does not sin unto himself. Now, none of the other commandments, just that threat is not, not carried to any of the other commandments. This is the only commandment that that, can thread, that thread is that's tied to. So evidently, idol worship is something that is, is a, a very grievous sin that God wants men to know that the consequences of it are far reaching. But I'm glad that the same God said it to the third and fourth generation. He didn't say it would last forever. He did put a time limit on it. You know, sometimes I wonder, you know, we, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but nowhere in the Bible does God condemn slavery. He condemns the cruel treatment of slaves, but he does not condemn slavery. You say, you think God's for slavery? I think God uses slavery. I think God uses slavery to warn men. You can rebel if you want to. But the consequences are far reaching. A lot of people who were, who were slaves were not slaves because of what they did. You realize that a lot of the slaves that came from Africa, they were not slaves because of what they did. They were slaves because of what their fathers did. Their fathers chose to go to war with another another nation that they could not conquer. And as a result, they and their children ended up slaves. And those people got sold, by the way. And just, 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 just for your, your history lesson, America did not invent slavery. Slaves were here long before America, America became a nation. The English brought the slaves over. When they were when America was still an English colony, they're the ones that brought the slaves over. But even England didn't didn't create, uh, invent slavery. And slavery did not end in America even when America freed their slaves either. You know the Muslims still have slaves today. Men have been enslaved for years and years and years since the beginning of time. You know what Nimrod was doing? He was hunting men and making slaves out of them. You know why Nimrod was doing that? 
Because Nimrod had no fear of God, no care, no concern for God. And the people of Nimrod's generation had turned their back on God. Why did you say, preacher, what are you, what are you trying to get across? I'm, what I'm trying to get across to you this morning is that we can rebel against God if we choose to, but we do not get to choose the consequences, and we do not get to choose how long those consequences last. And you and I need to understand that. You and I need to understand that. Rebelling against God is costly. America can rebel against God, but America cannot control the consequences of it. And they cannot control how long that those consequences last. You and I may be slaves to China before too long. And if we are, you say, well, preacher, I'm not rebelling against God, but a lot of our forefathers have. But now I'm glad to report to you. You notice he says, that visiting the iniquity of the fathers, one of the children, unto the third and fourth generation, them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep his commandments. Now here's the generational. Listen, he said to, to the third and fourth generation. So if it goes to the fourth generation, that's four generations that's going to be stuck in slavery. If we use the slavery, for example. And that's four generations. But aren't you glad that in those four generations, everybody that's in those generations, does not have to be exiled from God. He says, showing mercy. Now that doesn't mean that they'll be free from, from the bondage that they're in. But that does not, doesn't mean that they have to they have to die and go to hell either. You see, salvation is an individual choice. Your mom and daddy can't get you saved, and your mom and daddy can't keep you from being saved. Your mom and daddy can have you baptized as a baby if they want to, but that won't save you. Salvation is an individual choice. Your mom and daddy may live a life that puts you in the, in, in the debt and the poverty and, and maybe robs you of education, robs you the, of the ability to, to improve your life on, on a financial aspect and you may be stuck in poverty for a long time, but that doesn't mean that you have to be miserable in your poverty. You see what America does where America associates poverty with wickedness and and and, uh, and uh, the, the that the fact that God doesn't love you and they associate riches with the fact that God does love you but that's not true you can be rich and God and still be God's enemy and you can be poor and still be God's friend the choice is yours showing mercy unto who? Those that will choose to love him. No matter your condition, no matter your, your, your circumstance life, no matter how you're brought up, no matter where you live, if you choose to love God, you can love God and God will bless you and help you. He, like I say, he may not deliver you out of that poverty, but you can have peace and joy while you're in it. How many people have struck it rich in this life. I read here somewhere, you know that just about everybody who wins the lottery ends up broke. Most of them end up in jail. Money. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. And unfortunately, many people get money and then they fall in love with it. And the next thing you know, their money's controlling them. And they end up miserable because of it. God will visit any man who will choose to love him. Again, he says, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my command. So let me ask you this morning. You got anything that you're putting ahead of God? You got anything that you're worshiping more than God? Anything? What's your view of God? What what determines what you think of God? If this blessed old book doesn't determine what you think of God, listen, don't don't be like uh, well, like some of those kids told me. I think you told my wife they said, we know it's this way because we saw it on TV. She was reading them to us, reading them out of the Bible, and they didn't believe it because they saw it on TV. Don't let TV 
uh, influence what you think about God? Let this blessed old book. You say, well, preach, I read things in there I don't understand. Well, thank God for it. I'd hate to know I serve a God that I can understand everything about. I'm glad that that God that I serve is bigger than I am. Because I got some problems that are bigger than I am. I got a problem with old sinful nature that's bigger than I am. And I need a God bigger than I am to be able to take care of it. I'm glad I serve such a God. What about you this morning? What kind of God do you serve? Do you serve a God with a little G? Do you serve a God that can't do this and he can't do that? A God that you have to do everything for? Or do you serve a God that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask for? I serve such a God in this matter of salvation. You see, I needed a Savior. I didn't need a good example. I didn't need someone stronger than I am. I needed a God who could do something about my sin problem that I could not do anything about. And this God came down in human flesh, lived a life that God demands that we should live. And after he lived that life in absolute perfection, not one time did he disappoint his father in anything that he said or did or even thought. That God, wrapped in human flesh, came down and lived all that I should have done, did everything that I should do but couldn't do, went to Calvary's cross, died under the wrath of Almighty God to pay the penalty that I would have to spend eternity in hell trying to pay. They took him down from that cross, put him in a, in a tomb. He stayed there for three days and three nights. But early on a Sunday morning, the angel came down and rolled the stone away. And they did not roll the stone away so that he could get out. They rolled the stone away because those ladies came in the next morning and said, who will roll the stone away from the grave that we can get into anointing? They came down and found out that God had already taken care of the problem. And they thought the angels looked at him and said, Why do you seek to live in among the dead? He's not here. He's written like he said. Why did he do that? Because I had a problem that I could not take care of. And I'm not going to bring that God down to a level that I can understand. I'm not going to bring him down to a level that says I've got to do everything under the sun in order to get to heaven because he can't take care of the problem. There's nothing in this world that you can compare to God. So let's serve him for who he is. Father, we love you this morning. I pray, Father, there's one here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that this morning they'll realize that there's a God in heaven who's able to do exceeding, abundantly above all that we ask or think, and provide a, uh, provide a salvation to the uttermost, so that nothing needs to be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it, because it's absolutely perfect. And Father, there's one here this morning that's never put their trust in Jesus Christ, that perfect Savior. I pray that today they'll do so. And I pray that, Father, we'll realize there's none like you. There's none like you, and we won't compare you to anything and put anything in our sight to try to, to represent you. But this blessed old book. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. And that's what you can say this morning. Somebody, one preacher said it's just as wrong as, just as wrong to sing a lie as it is to tell one. Are you trusting him and trusting him alone? If not, will you do it today? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Again, if there's one here not saved, we'll just save them this morning. And uh, we sure would, would give you glory and praise for it. And uh, Lord, help us. Help us to realize who you are and to worship you for who you are. To take this blessed old book and read about the God that we can't explain. 
and just worship you for who you are. We pray these things again in Jesus' name. Pray to bless and keep each one as they travel home today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.